it's easy to overlook a place like Olorgesailie, a quiet, unassuming spot in East Africa. But beneath the surface, it holds a remarkable story that sounds like science fiction. Here, our ancestors took on one of the most formidable creatures of the Ice Age, Theropithecus oswaldi. These beasts were three times the size of a baboon and had razor-sharp canines. They also lived in tightly knit social groups that made them nearly untouchable. And yet, our ancestors hunted them. Why take such a dangerous gamble? What tools, tactics, and instincts did they rely on? And what can this reveal about the minds of those who walked the earth long before us? Let's delve into this fascinating mystery. The site of Alorgesailie is located on the floor of the Eastern Rift Valley in southern Kenya. Hundreds of thousands of years ago, it was situated near the shores of an ancient lake. This provided its inhabitants with access to water, which also attracted many animals like hippo, zebra, antelope, and elephants. The earliest human finds from this site date back nearly a million years ago. Abundant hand axes have been found, and in 2003, the frontal bone of a Homo erectus was discovered. Hand axes were an essential tool for Homo erectus, one of our direct ancestors. Homo erectus is credited with inventing the so-called Acheulean hand axes around 1.7 million years ago, and they used them for over a million years. These tools were highly effective for butchering animals and may have been used as weapons. Alorgasaly was used as a camp for hundreds of thousands of years. The layers which contain the subject of today's video are slightly younger, dating between 400 to 700,000 years old. By this time, Homo erectus had already spread across much of the world, and new species such as Homo heidelbergensis were emerging. These hominids had larger brains, more modern anatomy, and were associated with more advanced tools. While it is possible that the hominins at Alorgasaly were members of Homo heidelbergensis, the lack of physical remains leaves us with uncertainty. What we do know is that these hominins were proficient hunters. The butchered remains of hippopotamus, elephant, zebra, giraffe, and therapithecus have all been found at the site. They likely employed simple wooden spears to ambush and kill some of these animals. Others may have been scavenged. It is also possible that they practiced persistence hunting which consists of chasing down a prey animal until exhaustion and then finishing the animal off. Given that we know they were capable of long-distance running, this method could have been used. However, and wherever these animals were killed, they ultimately brought their remains back to their camp at Alorgasaly. Here, they used their hand axes to cut and consume the meat, which was likely eaten raw. The animals found at Alorgasaly are fairly typical for a middle Pleistocene Africa, except for one animal, Therapithecus oswaldi. Therapithecus oswaldi wasn't your average primate. Weighing around 140 pounds or 65 kilograms, which is about the size of a female gorilla, it was a formidable animal. Large males could even weigh up to 160 pounds or 72 kilograms in some cases. With sharp canines and powerful muscles, Therapithecus was not to be messed with. The genus Therapithecus is actually still around today. Known as Therapithecus gelata, or just the gelata, these fascinating animals live in the Ethiopian highlands. Males are only around 40 pounds or 18 kilograms on average, but they are still quite intimidating animals. They are covered in thick fur with a dark face and a bright red chest. They are the only primate that primarily eats grass, though don't assume this means they are soft. Violence is common between competing males. They use their large fangs to target their opponent's face. Occasionally, entire groups clash over territory or control over females. They commonly flip their upper lip to show their gums and monstrous canines. Modern gelatas are the closest living animal we have to study when thinking about Therapithecus oswaldi. Oswaldi may have looked similar with a unique coat of fur and a bright red chest. Imagine a bulky alpha male oswaldi flipping up its lip to show you its teeth. This must have been an absolutely terrifying sight to see for early humans. An interesting aspect that we have inferred is that Therapithecus oswaldi wouldn't have been a great climber. It was even more poorly adapted to tree or cliff climbing than modern geladas, which are rarely observed climbing trees. This vulnerability may have made them a tempting though dangerous target for early human hunters. Like geladas, they likely lived in large social groups. There was typically one dominant male and several subordinate males that would have been extremely dangerous. 
Male Homo erectus were only around 5 foot 5 or 165 centimeters tall and between 100 to 150 pounds, meaning that the larger Therapithecus individuals would have outweighed most if not all erectus individuals. Now that we have an understanding of both our hominin hunters and Therapithecus, it is time to talk about the evidence we have found. In layers dating between 400 to 700,000 years old, researchers have found 4,700 stone artifacts and the remains of 90 Therapithecus individuals. Most are concentrated in an area approximately 12 to 15 meters squared. It is impossible to estimate the duration of the period of occupation, though it appears to have been relatively brief. Therapithecus are very rare animals in the fossil record, and so many in one place cause researchers to get suspicious. Furthermore, virtually every bone is broken, and the association with stone tools made a compelling case for butchery. Given the evidence, three hypotheses can be formulated. One, a non-hominid predator was responsible for the accumulation and breakage of the bones. Two, hominids were responsible for the accumulation and breakage of the primate bones. 3. An unknown factor such as disease or starvation was responsible for a mass death of Therapithecus, and the bones were broken in some post-mortem event. In order to get down to the bottom of this, they had to look closer at the remains. A total of 90 individual Therapithecus are preserved at Alorgasaly. 76 are juveniles and 14 are adults. 70% fall between 6 months to 3 years of age. This is strange, as these individuals only typically make up about 36% of the population in modern gelata groups. It appears that there was some bias towards younger and smaller individuals. The mortality pattern of Alorgasaly geladas most closely resembles that produced by attritional mortality. Attritional mortality refers to the gradual loss of life within a population over time, rather than a catastrophic event. This would make sense with either of the hunting hypotheses since both hominids and animal predators would target young individuals. And it also rules out hypothesis 3. By examining the patterns of skeletal damage, we can assess whether hypothesis 1 or hypothesis 2 is more likely. The heads of the animals appear to have been targeted with force, perhaps suggesting a blunt force weapon. No cut marks have been found on the bones, though they were broken to free the muscles of their attachments. The skeletal elements show high frequencies of flaking, splintering, and irregular articular breaks. The Therapithecus remains were broken very consistently, suggesting hominids were butchering them in a systematic method. Overall, Hypothesis 2 has the most supporting evidence. These giant geladas appear to have been hunted, brought back to camp, and butchered by the hominids. At the relatively nearby Olduvai Gorge, another Therapithecus specimen has been found that appears to have been hunted. The skull of a Therapithecus had clearly been damaged by hominids. It has a massive depressed fracture surrounded by deep grooves and scratches on the right parietal. The injury would have been fatal if the animal was alive. The hominids used a wooden or bone club to smash the animal's head, or perhaps even a stone hand axe was used. Either way, it is interesting at this relatively nearby site, the head of a Therapithecus was also targeted. The fact that only two sites contained Therapithecus remains with evidence that hominids hunted them may suggest that this kind of hunting was rare. Though we still have to talk about how these animals were hunted. As mentioned earlier, Therapithecus were quite large animals when fully grown and live in tight-knit communities that will defend themselves if necessary. The authors of the paper suggested that we look at how the Hadza tribe of Tanzania hunt baboons. They encircle the roosting place of a baboon troop in a grove of trees around a small rock outcrop. Then they dislodge the baboons by shooting arrows and making a great noise. As the baboons try to break out of the circle, they are clubbed to death with bow staves. Woodburn reports that 6 to 10 baboons are a normal kill. This is an interesting account, though for many reasons we can't compare them directly. What I found most interesting is that the baboons which try to flee are clubbed. Given our evidence at hand, this scenario is certainly possible. Therapithecus groups may have been encircled, the hunters may have stayed away from the dominant alpha male, and then waited for a younger individual to try to flee. This is just one possible strategy out of hundreds, but it is interesting to see a direct example. The last question we have to answer is why? Why go after such dangerous and deadly prey? There are many species of ungulates nearby as well as turtles, fish, insects, nuts, plants, and more. They would have certainly exploited all these food resources as well. A point to mention is that many prey animals are actually quite dangerous, and some far more dangerous than a Therapithecus. 
Hippopotamus, rhinoceros, buffalo, and elephants could kill a hominid in one motion. Even an antelope or a warthog could easily cause fatal injuries. Therapithecus certainly could have killed a hominid, but probably not quickly, especially if there were multiple other erectus clubbing and stabbing it in the back. Therapithecus may have been easier to track down than fleet-footed antelope. They are very poor climbers and not great runners either. Once a younger individual was separated from a group or found in a smaller group, hominids would have been able to throw spears and rocks to immobilize them, then finish the job with a club. These hominids, whether erectus or heidelbergensis, could throw about as efficiently as modern humans. They undoubtedly would have taken advantage of this ability to hunt these animals. The authors of this paper propose that Therapithecus may have been hunted seasonally or as part of a ceremonial rite of passage event. One of the reasons hunting baboons is important to the Hadza culture is due to its effects on social status. A successful hunt naturally enhances the hunter's reputation and social prestige. This may have very well been the motivation to hunt these strange animals. Perhaps seasonally, the group would set off on a Therapithecus hunt, with young males trying to prove their status in the tribe. Maybe a young hunter was sent by himself in the middle of the night to sneak up and club a Therapithecus. That would certainly make for an interesting movie, but it could have very well have been reality. There are real examples from San Bushmen, the Inuit, and Aboriginal Australian cultures having rites of passage that required young boys to perform a solitary hunt. Though we should be careful not to romanticize the lives of people we know so little about, it is just too fascinating not to. Our species has been around for roughly 300,000 years, and these people were only around 200,000 years older than the first Homo sapiens. It is not controversial to say that these were people with complex lives, powerful emotions, and a wonderful culture. I absolutely love watching old documentaries about the lives of hunter-gatherers when they lived solely off of the land. Watching the Inuit spear a seal or the aboriginals gut a kangaroo is just truly magical to me. I mean, I love hunting and fishing, but they're just doing it on a completely other level. I understand those who find hunting abhorrent, I truly do, but it is a part of our story that cannot be ignored. Hunter Stephen Ranella said, Maybe stalking the woods is as vital to the human condition as playing music or putting words to paper. Maybe hunting has as much of a claim on our civilized selves as anything else. After all, the earliest forms of representational art reflect hunters and prey. While the arts were making us spiritually viable, hunting did the heavy lifting of not only keeping us alive, but inspiring us. To abhor hunting is to hate the place from which you came which is akin to hating yourself in some distant, abstract way. I am curious about what you all think of hunting and its importance to humanity throughout the past. Whether you see it as a cultural cornerstone or a controversial practice, it's a topic worth reflecting on. Let's have a productive conversation in the comments. The story of Alorga Sali and its mysterious Therapithecus remains offers us a glimpse into just how much of our prehistoric past has been left untold. The hunt for such powerful and dangerous primates reveals how courageous our ancestors truly were. Their motivations for taking on such a challenge may hint to their social complexity. Were they hunting for status, or the sake of the hunt? We will never know. As we unearth more evidence from sites like Alorgasali, we continue to piece together the story of who we are and where we came from. The greatest story ever told. Thank you all for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I really enjoyed making it. I mean, this is a site I had known about for a while, but I hadn't gotten in depth and actually studied it more. And honestly, there's not that much out about it. I mean, it was a great paper, but it's from 1981. So I hope they find more sites in uh, East Africa relating to Therapithecus or maybe even Dinopithecus. That'd be really cool. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. This one was only made in about a week because, hey, I'm done with the school now. I graduated college, so I'll be able to make a lot more content now. So make sure you leave a like, those actually really do help. A comment would be great. And uh, subscribe if you haven't, of course. Share the video, whatever. Do all that stuff. I love you guys. Goodbye.